Welcome back. Today we're going to start our journey looking at covalent bonding. We've already looked at ionic and metallic, so we're going to look at molecular bonding this time, so things that are covalently bonded together. This comes from chapter 6 in your textbook, and essentially these are the key things that you need to be able to do by the end of this unit. You want to be able to explain the properties of molecular substances um, and contrast these with your ionic and metallic bonding reference to their structure in terms of both intra- and intermolecular forces, which we will go through, and understand the different ways that we can represent molecular structures. This includes electron dot formulas, which you will have seen previously in your junior science studies, structural formulas using correct shape, ball and stick models, and space filling models, which we will investigate as we move through and build and use some of these together. The other one is looking at the limitations of the representations of these models. So what do they show us? What do they show inaccurately? And how can, what information can we get from each of these representations? So as I said before, we've looked at the different types of bonding because how bonding occurs, whether it's between a metal, non-metal, or a combination of both as we see in ionic, depends uh, well, influences strongly the properties that we see for these compounds. So when we're talking about covalent bonding, we're talking about bonding between two non-metals. And this, you may remember, we've been defining what the attraction between the different particles is in terms of bonding. And this is the attraction between a positive nucleus and a negatively charged shared electrons. Because in covalent, the key thing here is that we are sharing electrons between the two atoms involved in the bond. Unlike metals where they were delocalized through the lattice or Metal, uh, metals and non-metals where we saw ionic bonds where we have transfer of electrons. In this case, we are sharing electrons between two atoms. This means that all the electrons are localized, so we don't tend to see these being able to carry an electrical charge because they are neutral molecules, so they're not charged. So we don't tend to see these being able to conduct in any state, be it liquid, aqueous, solid, or gas. So covalent bonds are formed when a non-metal atom share electrons, as we said. They differ from ionic bonds because there's no direct transfer of an electron from one atom to another. The electrons are attracted equally, or sometimes equally and sometimes not, to the nuclei of the atoms involved in the bond. Because this sits between, okay, this is within the bond, we call it intramolecular. So intra means within. So the covalent bond itself, so the covalent bond itself is known as an intramolecular bond. Okay, so we have in covalent intramolecular bonds that form from the sharing of electrons. This is important because we have two types of forces involved when we're talking about molecular substances and how they behave. There are the intramolecular bonds, which are these ones here, which hold the atoms together, and they are strong. They're really, really strong. Um, in order to break that, we would break the molecule and change the substance. However, intermolecular bonds, these are the bonds between molecules, okay, so between molecules, they are weak, and this is what determines the melting point and boiling point of substances. Okay, so this explains why a lot of molecular compounds are gases or liquids at room temperature, because those states are determined by the strength of the intermolecular bonding between the molecules. So for intramolecular bonding, sorry, we're talking about non-metals, so this means that they're on the right-hand side of our periodic table, so they have high electronegativities. These elements are able to attract electrons easily and don't give them up. So they will share, but they're not going to give them away. So the sharing of electron pairs between two metallic atom, non-metallic atoms is how we define the covalent bond. 
It's important to note when we have changes of state, such as going from ice to water, so solid ice to liquid water, the intramolecular bonds are unaltered. Water remains as a water molecule. These bonds, the intramolecular bonds, are not broken when we change state. All we're doing is disrupting the intermolecular forces between the molecules. So we're not breaking the molecules themselves, we're just breaking the bonds that are between the molecules and expanding the space between the molecules themselves. So in water, we can see we have an individual water molecule. So these are known, we call these as discrete molecules. Okay, so we can count them. Okay, and in a substance or a glass of water, we're going to have many molecules that are attracted to each other using hydrogen bonds, which are intermolecular bonds. When we increase the energy in this system, we have the intermolecular bonds strong in the solid, and then as we increase the energy, we increase the space between the molecules, which disrupts the intermolecular forces. So when we share unpaired electrons, both atoms can complete their outer shells. So what they're doing is they are aiming to have a complete octet. Now with hydrogen, of course, it is stable with two electrons in its outer shell. So hydrogen forms a stable diatomic molecule. This is the same for all diatomic molecules such as chlorine, bromine, iodine, any of the halogens, they require only one more electron in their outer shell, so they form stable diatomic molecules. And we can see this here with this diagram. The electrostatic attraction between the nuclei and the shared pair of electrons is equal, so we get this bond forming. So here we have the formation of the bond. And this is because this chlorine requires one more to have a full stable electron configuration of 288, and so does this chlorine. So if they share at any one point in time, they both feel like they have a complete octet and they are stable. So our covalent molecular substances share properties as with our ionic compounds shared properties, and they are quite different due to the nature of the bonds. They have low melting and boiling points because the attractions between part, uh, the molecules is weak. So they're liquids or gases at room temperature. They don't conduct electricity in liquid, solid, or aqueous. Okay, and this is because there's no charged particles free to move throughout the substance. They don't tend to be soluble in water because they often are waxy substances at room temperature. They're softer and they tend to be more flammable than ionic compounds. When we name covalent compounds, they have different rules for naming than our ionic compounds. So the noble gases exist as single atoms, and they're just named after the atom that they are. Um, our halogens form diatomic molecules, and again, these are just chlorine, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Okay, so we just know them by their name. When we have molecules that are made up of different atoms, okay, so molecular compounds, we now need to look at how many of each atom. And we didn't do this with ionic in the name, but we do for covalent. So this nitrogen oxide here, or nitrogen monoxide, water, which is a common name. There are some common names that we look at. Nitrogen dioxide means I have one nitrogen and two oxygens, and of course carbon dioxide. So we use the group prefixes to indicate the number of each atom present in the molecule. So these will be mono, so mon, di, tri, tetra, pent or penta, and then we have hexa for six, hept or hepta for seven, octa for eight, and then non or nona for nine, and then deca for ten. 
So these will be same as the ones that you're used to in maths as well. So nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen with two oxygens is going to be nitrogen dioxide. Then we have nitrogen tri dinitrogen trioxide is two nitrogens and three oxygens. Dinitrogen tetraoxide is two and four. All the way through, we can have sulfur hexafluoride, iodine heptafluoride, tetraphosphodecoxide. So they can get pretty complicated, but it's always just giving us the number of each element that is present. So when we name binary covalent compounds, i.e. ones that have a two-part name, we first name the element in full, so nitrogen or oxygen, and then the second element named like it was an anion. So if it's oxygen, we change the last part of it to ide. So nitrogen, so this is our dinitrogen trioxide, because the second element in the name is named as if it's an anion like with inorganic, uh, ionic compounds. So we would have carbon dioxide. So if we look at this, this means that number of each atom type is indicated by a prefix. Mono is never used if it's in the first element. So where we had NO2, which was nitrogen dioxide, it's not mono nitrogen dioxide, it is just nitrogen dioxide. Then the second element begins with a vowel, then um, and the A and the O, just to make it easier, we drop the A from the prefix. So dinitrogen pentoxide rather than dinitrogen pentaoxide. So if we have a look at these, here we would have dinitrogen tetraoxide, oxygen difluoride, chlorine dioxide, diiodine pentoxide, sulfur hexafluoride, silicon tetrachloride. There are some molecules that we give common names to, okay, or trivial names. So we don't call water dihydrogen monoxide, we call it water. We also have ammonia, which is NH3, and then we have a different naming convention for hydrocarbons, which we'll learn later in this semester. So CH4 is known as methane. So I want you to pause the video, have a go at naming these and giving the formulas for the other ones, and then come back and get the answers. Hopefully you were able to name these. So in our first one we have one iodine. Remember we don't use mono if it's the first element, so it's iodine heptafluoride because we have seven and that's hept. Then we have dinitrogen pentoxide, so we have two nitrogens and five oxygens. We have OF2, which is a single oxygen, so no mono, oxygen difluoride, because we have two here, so oxygen difluoride. Then they want us to write the formula, so we have silicon, which is SI. Tetra tells us it's four, and then we've got Cl, so SiCl4. Disulfur, sulfur is S, di is two, fluoride is F, and then we're going to have deca, which is 10, so we get S2. F10. Okay, we will practice some of these in class. I'll see you then, and good luck!